Well, thank you very much, um, uh, Lynn. Uh, uh, it's wonderful to see such a, a large audience for this um, special uh, Kristallnacht uh, uh, lecture. And it's uh, a particular pleasure to welcome, on, on, on behalf of um, uh, uh, Lynn Jackson and the Holocaust Education Trust of Ireland, and also Zuleika uh, Rogers of the Herzog Center, who can't be here tonight, but who is, uh, uh, which is the joint, that center is also the joint sponsor of this event. And it's a particular pleasure to renew the continuing contacts which, uh, which both universities, uh, UCD and TCD, have with the Holocaust Education Trust of Ireland. Well, Kristallnacht, 9th of November, 1938, was a, a, a particularly a grim moment, I guess, in some respects, a kind of uh, change of pace, a pace change in the uh, a project, the developing project of Nazi uh, anti-Semitism, uh, and something which took many, I think, um, uh, by surprise, although perhaps not those within the movement. And I can think of no better person to address us on that subject tonight than uh, 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 my uh, colleague and, and close friend from UCD, um, uh, two centers for war studies collaborate uh, closely um, between Trinity and UCD, uh, Robert Gavart. Robert has been um, uh, in UCD um, since 2008, I think. He's professor of um, uh, uh, modern history in UCD and director of the UCD Center of War Studies. Uh, he has uh, an extraordinary range of interests and publishing achievements in German 20th century history, in the history of the two world wars, and indeed the period between them. His first book was a study of the, uh, the myth of Bismarck in the interwar period, but since then, he's worked extensively in a number of um, edited collections and seminal articles on aspects of the First and the uh, Second uh, uh, World Wars. And he is also the editor of an Oxford University Press uh, uh, series called The Greater War, which is all about placing the First World War in a broader 20th century context. But I think of particular relevance to tonight's talk is Robert's uh, uh, very fine a biography of a very unfine person, of um, uh, Heydrich, uh, his book Hitler's Hangman, The Life of Heydrich, uh, published in 2011. Uh, an extraordinary and a fine biography because I think the question of how one writes with a sense of real understanding about somebody of this kind is perhaps one of the greatest challenges that a historian can face. And it's a book which I would very strongly commend to you because I think that Robert rises magnificently uh, to that challenge. Well, Heydrich, I think, is an important person in, in tonight's story. And so it's with great pleasure that I ask Robert to talk to us about the 9th of November 1938 and the reversal of Nazi Jewish policies, a perpetrator's perspective. Robert. Well, thank you very much, John, for this uh, very warm introduction. Uh, it is a great honor and privilege for me to give this year's annual lecture to commemorate the pogrom of 9 November 1938. And I have to thank uh, Lynn Jackson of the Holocaust Education Trust in Ireland and Zuleika Rogers of Trinity College Dublin for kindly inviting me to speak this evening. What got me invited, and uh, John already hinted that, I suppose, is my biography of Reinhard Heydrich, a man who played a very significant role in the history of the Holocaust, uh, namely as chief organizer of the largest genocide in European, if not world history, uh, at least until his uh, death in 1942 as a result of an assassination attempt by Czech uh, parachutists who were flown into the protectorate by uh, the Royal Air Force. Um, it is through his perspective that I want to talk about Pogrom at night this evening to you. For those of you who do not know Heydrich, let me just briefly give you a very brief uh, summary of his career in Nazi Germany. Um, by the time of his death in 1942, he was only 38 years old, uh, yet he held three key positions in the Nazi dictatorship. Uh, first of all, he was chief of the so-called Reich Security Main Office, uh, which is a kind of umbrella organization for the Gestapo, 
the SS intelligence service or security service, and thirdly, uh, the criminal police, so in other words, the political police organizations of Nazi Germany that were responsible for uh, the terror in the Third Reich. Uh, secondly, between 1938 and 1942, uh, he was in charge of Nazi Jewish policies. People often uh, confuse uh, his role with that of Himmler. Himmler actually had very little involvement in Jewish policies in the Third Reich until 1942, when he takes over as interim head of the Reich Security Main Office from Reinhard Heydrich. Thirdly, uh, from 1941 onwards, uh, he uh, was installed as so-called Reich Protector of Bohemia and Moravia, a kind of viceroy, um, directly responsible to Hitler for the occupation regime in the former Czech lands. Uh, it is the first, this is quite significant, this is the first regime, occupation regime, which is actually directly run by the SS, uh, which makes a huge difference uh, for the Jewish population of uh, the Bohemian lands at the time. So this triple uh, position arguably made him one of the most powerful individuals of the Third Reich. So in telling the story uh, of Kristallnacht through his eyes, I think uh, we must go back not so much to 1933 when uh, the first anti-Jewish policies are introduced, um, but really to uh, the spring of 1938 uh, and the Anschluss of Austria, which is a bit of a watershed event in uh, the escalation of anti-Jewish policies in Germany. Uh, without that prehistory, I think it is very difficult to understand the events of 9 November 1938. So then let me go back to the importance of the, um, of the Anschluss of Austria. On the 12th of February 1938, a meeting took place between Adolf Hitler and the Austrian Chancellor, uh, a man called Kurt Schuschnigg, uh, and the meeting took place in Hitler's mountain retreat on the German-Austrian border. In order to intimidate the uh, Austrian dictator into voluntarily giving up Austrian independence, Hitler had arranged for senior German police and military figures to be present, just sitting there in silence in the back of the room, including Himmler and Heydrich, uh, as well as the commander of the Condor Legion in Spain, responsible for the destruction of the Basque village of Guernica. He also had the German uh, chief of staff, uh, Wilhelm Keitel, the, the head of the German uh, high command, uh, sitting in the back of the room as well, just in case the Trushnik misunderstood uh, Hitler's intentions. So very clearly, the threat of war is, uh, is in the room. Uh, Hitler made it very clear um, also that military action would follow immediately if the Austrians did not bow to his demands. Meanwhile, the SS began their own extensive preparations for the invasion of Austria. Some 20,000 members of the order and security police uh, were mobilized and trained for the special uh, purpose of supporting uh, the Wehrmacht in its task of uh, occupying Germany's southern neighbor. Three weeks later, at 5.30 a.m. Uh, on uh, the 12th of March 1938, uh, German troops did indeed cross the Austrian border. They met with uh, no resistance. Most Austrians indeed welcomed the uh, annexation with great enthusiasm. But the Nazis were not taking any chances on the occasion, and among uh, the earliest arrivals in Vienna were Himmler and Heydrich, who actually arrived in Vienna before the German army, so uh, half an hour before the official beginning of the occupation or uh, annexation of um, Austria, they arrived at Vienna airport and immediately set about uh, recruiting some uh, 6,000 um, policemen from the Austrian SS. So in other words, what had happened in uh, Germany in 1933, the authorization of some uh, SS men and SA men uh, as auxiliary policemen was replicated in Austria immediately. Armed with fairly extensive arrest lists, um, the uh, SA and SS uh, quickly moved into action, arresting anyone uh, thought to pose a real or potential threat to Nazi rule, some 21,000 people uh, in all within two nights. The main immediate target of these arrests was the uh, Austrian Communist Party, uh, many of whom were sent immediately to the newly uh, created camp at Mauthausen uh, near Linz, uh, which was to become the harshest of all the concentration camps within uh, the Greater German Reich uh, before the invasion of the Soviet Union in 1941. 
But SS and SA terror was, of course, also immediately directed against Austria's Jews, uh, the overwhelming majority of whom, some 170,000 out of 200,000, uh, lived in Vienna. From the very beginning of the German invasion, riots occurred uh, against Jewish shops and uh, Jewish individuals. Uh, Austrian Nazis broke into Jewish businesses, houses, and apartments, where they were greeted um, by uh, intimidated uh, Jews who had not found the time to escape uh, before the Nazis could arrive. Uh, what you also see, of course, throughout Vienna in those days, and uh, this is captured in this picture here, is that uh, Jewish Austrians are forced to uh, clean the streets with uh, toothbrushes. Um, essentially, this task is all about uh, the humiliation. Uh, they make them uh, clean up graf uh, graffitis on the walls with anti-Nazi slogans. So essentially, uh, they are made to atone for a crime they, uh, did never, they never committed. Uh, they were frequently, in the process, pushed over, uh, doused with cold water, or kicked as they carried out their humiliating tasks. From the perspective of the SS, and that might surprise some people, uh, this was actually not um, desired. Um, the pogrom-like violent excesses in Austria uh, threatened uh, the orderly Gestapo operations and also threatened to undermine Heydrich's authority. He was... Um, he, he believed that he was conducting police operations. So the pogroms actually uh, threatened to undermine uh, his authority in Jewish matters. What he did instead was uh, to send a small team of very young um, SD, so uh, SS intelligence service um, intellectuals and activists uh, to Vienna, including the uh, then still very young and unknown Adolf Eichmann, uh, to take up their work in Vienna. The initial task of this group, um, <clears throat> which you see here in the bottom picture, uh, as they assemble uh, before they uh, descend on the uh, Jewish population of uh, Vienna, uh, they basically used a previously compiled list uh, to confiscate documents from Jewish organizations and uh, private individuals. Um, they, were, they also had the specific task of uh, disrupting the uh, pogrom-like uh, atmosphere in Vienna and other Austrian cities by arresting those party members uh, that had initiated them. By the 17th of March 1938, Heydrich actually issued an official order to arrest all Nazis uh, who were responsible for mob violence. That very same day, so we're still talking about the, the first week of the uh, occupation, uh, Heydrich uh, wrote to the newly uh, installed Gauleiter of Vienna in order to express his conviction that all arrests should be undertaken within an orderly framework and with at least the appearance of legality, arguing that it lay in the best interests of the Reich's foreign policy to depict conditions to the outside world as being as calm as possible. This, of course, did never mean that the terror in Austria was to be ended. Quite the contrary. The policy of what he called merciless combat against all political, intellectual, and criminal opponents, so he wrote in the SS journal Das Schwarze Korps, the Black Corps, um, was to be continued in silence. So that, in essence, um, points to a fundamental difference in the approaches of the Nazi party on the one hand, and uh, notably powerful uh, Gauleiter, so regional party leaders, uh, such as Goebbels or Julius Schleicher uh, in the south of Germany, and that of the SS. From the very start, uh, the SS had uh, prosecuted, persecuted um, enemies of the Reich, real or perceived, um, with very different means from the SA. They, uh, for example, took over control of the uh, Dachau concentration camps uh, in 1934, and essentially uh, tried very hard that no news about atrocities committed within Dachau would filter through to the rest of German society, which made their approach very distinct uh, from uh, that of the SA, which believed in, in pogrom-style attacks on Jews in order to induce them to leave the country as quickly as possible. The SS also initiated uh, the process of forced expulsions in a manner that was far more direct than it had been in uh, the Old Reich in, in Germany before the Anschluss. Um, 
So what they have in mind is a policy of induced immigration. So they want to make conditions for Jews living both in Germany and in newly annexed uh, Austria as impossible uh, as they can. In other words, they have no means of uh, uh, working, they have no means of supporting their families, uh, they have very limited uh, rights to travel and means to travel because they no longer uh, are allowed to drive cars or use public transports, and all of that is to be um, used in, in Austria as well. Um, a novelty in some ways was the introduction of the so-called Central Office uh, for Jewish Immigration, which uh, at the time was headed by uh, Adolf Eichmann, uh, whose procedures and techniques created specifically for Austria at the time were to have a wider application in the years that followed. So Heydrich Eichmann had rushed to Vienna and essentially with the explicit purpose of using the Jewish community or leaders of the Jewish community within Austria to register every Jew living in the country uh, and then uh, producing um, or rather accelerating the process of handing out exit visas. That was the idea. Uh, another idea was to keep that process cost neutral. So in other words, uh, wealthier Jews um, had to pay a horrendous exit uh, tax uh, before they could leave Austria. And that money was used not only to pay for the employees of the central agency, but also, and more importantly, to make poorer Jews more mobile. So in many ways, the problem, as uh, Heydrich and Eichmann saw it, was not so much to get richer Jews to leave the country, uh, but rather how to finance the uh, removal of poorer Jews. So with Heydrich's blessing then and the help of these forcibly enlisted members of the Viennese Jewish community uh, who were operating under constant threat of being uh, expelled themselves with their families, uh, Eichmann created this new system of accelerated uh, application processes for exit visas and of subsidizing the emigration of poorer Jews. The result, as Heydrich himself bragged uh, uh, within a, a year, was that some 100,000 Austrian Jews uh, had immigrated legally by uh, May 1939, so uh, within a relatively short period of time. Several thousands more had crossed the border illegally, many of them eventually uh, reaching Palestine. So this central agency model um, would subsequently, and this is why I'm starting uh, with the um, Anschluss of Austria, would uh, subsequently, after Kristallnacht, be adopted in the whole of Germany um, and would become official policy. But it wasn't previous to uh, Kristallnacht. In order to understand what changes then, why the dynamics change, why uh, anti-Semitism experiences a new high in Germany in that period, we have to uh, see that, of course, the incorporation of Austria into the Third Reich um, brought more than 200,000 additional Jews uh, within the remit of you know, Nazi-controlled territory. It actually frustrated um, those people in charge of anti-Jewish policies in the Third Reich because up until that point uh, they had only succeeded in inducing 120,000 German Jews to leave the country. So overnight the problem as they saw it had gotten bigger, not smaller. So compared to 1933 there were now more Jews living uh, in Germany, more Jews living in Germany than had ever been uh, the case. It really made the previous attempts of the SS uh, to resolve the Jewish question uh, seem uh, fertile and in vain. So, in consequence uh, of that, you see a surge in anti-Semitism in Germany. Uh, among the very first to uh, feel the full force of the Nazis' desire to rid Germany of its now increased Jewish population were the roughly uh, 70,000 uh, Polish Jews living in the Reich, uh, many of whom had fled their homeland as a consequence of the uh, pogroms that took uh, place everywhere in Eastern Europe in the immediate aftermath of the First World War, they had escaped to Germany. Um, but the Polish state, after they had left, declared them stateless. They took away their passports. So the Nazis now thought that these 70,000 Polish Jews living in Germany were stranded there forever. So they became the obvious first target of forced immigration policies within the Reich. So, Shortly after the Anschluss, the Gestapo and the security police detained and forcibly expelled a first wave of 18,000 uh, Polish Jews during the night of 28 
uh, October 1938. So essentially they were rounded up, pushed over the border uh, where there were no Polish uh, border guards with no passport uh, and essentially left to their destiny. Um, of course, the, the border was then heavily patrolled, so they couldn't come back into Germany. Caught up in this uh, very first wave of Nazi mass deportations was a Polish uh, master tailor named Zendel Grunspan, uh, his wife Rivka, and their two oldest children, all of whom were expelled into Poland. They were arrested in the city of uh, Hanover, where uh, they had been living for many years, and swiftly expelled across the German-Polish border. In Paris, uh, Grinspan's youngest son, Herschel, uh, who you see here on uh, one of the pictures, uh, heard of the fate that had befallen his family. Uh, humiliated and outraged, he decided to act, and on the 7th of November, in an act of revenge, uh, Herschel shot a junior official at the German embassy in Paris, Ernst von Rath, who you see in the second picture. Uh, Rath was severely injured, though he didn't uh, die immediately. So while von Rath's fate uh, was still hanging in the balance, um, Heydrich himself traveled to Munich, of course, on the 9th of November. The uh, senior Nazi figures always gathered uh, to commemorate the failed Hitler putsch of 1923. When he arrived in Munich, he learned that von Rath had succumbed to his injuries. The not altogether unexpected news of his death uh, arrived in Munich um, just before the official uh, commemoration ceremonies of the failed Hitler Putsch of 1923 had uh, begun. Now, clearly, the death of von Rath provided those Nazi leaders, like Goebbels, like Streicher, who felt that over the previous years they uh, had lost increasing influence over the direction of anti-Jewish policies within Germany, uh, most notably uh, people from the party and the um, SA that had been decapitated in 1934 with a welcome cue. So this was their opportunity to regain control over uh, the, po the direction of anti-Jewish policies in Nazi Germany. So Hitler, because of the, the political implications of the assassination of von Rath, left the meeting without making his customary speech, but instructed uh, Goebbels to speak instead. Goebbels, of course, immediately used the uh, opportunity uh, not only to speak about the, the Jewish rebel, as he uh, did in almost all of his speeches, uh, but he also referred to spontaneous actions against Jews that had already begun to erupt in parts of the Reich. Now, these were very localized, um, violent outbursts that he was referring to, but he essentially exaggerated their importance and was uh, suggesting that all of the party leaders who had who were present in the room, who had not instructed their followers uh, to do the same, were missing out on an opportunity and were also not as committed to uh, the anti-Semitic uh, cause as, as he was and as um, some of the other party leaders were. Now, Heydrich was among the audience that evening in the Munich uh, City Hall um, there are different accounts of what he said that evening. Some people suggested that if uh, pogroms erupted, um, the political police would not interfere, which is actually um, difficult to believe, uh, judged by his subsequent actions, which uh, I will talk about now. So, in brief, what happens then is that the assembled regional party leaders um, make the necessary inference from Goebbels' speech and immediately pick up the phones. They call their party comrades in the local constituencies um, and tell them to unleash a pogrom. Uh, Heydrich, in the meantime, returns to his hotel to confer with Himmler, who wasn't uh, in attendance at the meeting, uh, what to do with that situation. Of course, you have to uh, bear in mind that the history of the Third Reich is, a, is the history of a constant power battle between different institutions, um, not only about the most radical solutions to uh, certain issues that they see as problems, uh, but also between uh, the army uh, as a more conservative institution uh, that becomes radicalized subsequently. Now, shortly after this meeting, he picks up the phone and instructs all Gestapo officers in Germany uh, that a number of anti-Jewish actions would begin very shortly all over the Reich, especially against synagogues. Um, and uh, as he instructs, these incidents are not to be hindered, uh, but looting and larger excesses, as he calls them, are to be prevented. 
At the same time, he instructs the police to be prepared for the arrest of some 20 to 30,000 Jews, especially, as he uh, highlights, wealthier Jews. Now, the very hectic sequence of orders indicates that the SS leadership had been surprised by the beginning and extent of the pogrom. <coughs> Throughout the Reich, Nazi activists, as we all know, began destroying synagogues and Jewish shops, uh, demolishing the interiors of private homes, uh, stealing their belongings, and forcefully pulling Jews out of their houses only uh, to humiliate, abuse, and in many cases, uh, murder them. Uh, the official uh, number of Jewish deaths uh, was later estimated at 91, but uh, it can safely be assumed that this uh, figure is too low. In addition, numerous uh, Jews committed suicide, and of the approximately 30,000 uh, Jewish men who were arrested and shipped to concentration camps that night, more than 1,000 died uh, either during their imprisonment or as a result of the long-term uh, effects of abuse during imprisonment. Uh, furthermore, an estimated 7,000 Jewish businesses, 117 private houses, and 177 uh, synagogues were destroyed, inflicting material damage of several hundred million Reichsmarks. The full force of the pogrom was also felt, of course, in the newly annexed territories in the Sudetenland and also in Austria. Uh, in Vienna alone, 42 uh, synagogues were burned down uh, that night. Uh, most of the remaining Jewish-owned shops were destroyed, and nearly 2,000 Jewish families uh, were ejected from their houses and apartments. But still, despite it all, Kristallnacht was initially a frustrating event for the SS and Heydrich in particular, because it undermined their attempts to organize a more systematic expulsion of the Jews and to have ownership of the process of conducting uh, anti-Jewish policies in the Third Reich. The SS was also uh, very keen on monitoring public opinion, and they were aware that public support for discrimination and enforced immigration uh, existed, but it did not necessarily extend to public mass murder and mass destruction of property. Furthermore, they were aware that the pogroms unnecessarily aroused international protests at a time when Hitler was beginning uh, to think about more expansionist uh, foreign policy objectives. Yet, of course, from the perspective of the SS, there were desirable side effects, uh, namely the acceleration of the speed of immigration of frightened Jews. So, immediately after the, um, the, the, the pogrom, we see a general increase of the number of Jews who decide to leave Germany, both in uh, 38 and 39. Uh, 39, of course, after the outbreak of the, the First World War, there are fewer and fewer opportunities to leave uh, the, the boundaries, the borders of the Reich, until finally in 1941, emigration is declared illegal uh, by Himmler as chief of the German uh, police. So what happens then? Why, why is the Kristallnacht such a turning point? Um, essentially, uh, Heydrich was conscious of the events that had taken place in, in Vienna. He actually inspected, visited and inspected the central agency there in November 1938 and uh, wrote a short report about it, which I think is very uh, instructive. He wrote, the establishment of the central agency guarantees the speedy issue of immigration visas to Jews, usually within eight days. According to our assessment, approximately 25,000 Jews have so far been made to emigrate by the central agency, uh, so that the overall number of Jews having left Austria is now approximately 50,000. The central agency does not put an extra financial burden on us because its employees and, uh, are self-financed by a departure tax levied on every Jewish emigrant. In view of the success of the central agency regarding Jewish immigration, it is recommended that a similar, even larger office is set up in Berlin for the whole of the Reich. This report was actually written at a very critical time, uh, because only two days after the pogrom, on the 12th of November, uh, the future uh, Nazi Jewish policy was discussed during a very high-level conference convened by Hermann Göring, at the time the second most powerful man in Nazi Germany. Göring was actually outraged, um, not so much by, of course, the, the people that had been killed during the pogrom, but much more by the economic implications uh, of that night. Um, 
So he was, he was outraged that so much property had been destroyed rather than taking it away from the Jews and handing it over to the, the German authorities. So this is the, the situation then where Heydrich sees his opportunity. He calls during that meeting for an accelerated emigration of Jews from Germany, points to the previous successes of the Jewish agency in Vienna, and indeed recommends the creation of a similar agency uh, in Berlin. Um, if implemented, Heydrich insists, then uh, similar success rates as in Austria could be achieved in Germany, and within a couple of years, the Jewish question would be uh, resolved altogether. Um, the fact that Heydrich's suggestion of an organized expulsion of German Jews met with Goering's approval at this meeting was the decisive enabling factor uh, for uh, the future role of the SS in anti-Jewish policies. So from now on, it is no longer the party that decides the, the line, it is the SS, which of course does not differ fundamentally from the party in the ultimate objective. In fact, in, if anything, they are more radical. But they choose very different means, at least until the outbreak uh, of the Second World War, in achieving that aim. So the comprehensive expulsion program developed by uh, the SS's self-appointed Jewish uh, experts over the preceding years now became the official policy of the Nazi regime, uh, sanctioned by Goering and indeed by Hitler um, himself. So in late January 1939, uh, Heydrich successively informed the heads of the German ministries that the Reich Central Agency for Jewish Immigration had now been set up, so within a relatively brief period of time, um, only uh, not even two months after, um, after the, the, the pogrom, and uh, that the SS was now the sole agency dealing with the issue of Im Jewish immigration from Germany. So although he had not initiated uh, the pogrom of uh, 9 November, it uh, turned out to be a major turning point in uh, the direction of anti-Jewish policies in Nazi Germany. Um, for Goebbels, who had actually instigated the pogrom on the evening of 9 November, it ended all uh, dreams of regaining the influence that he had had in the earlier stages of the, of the Third Reich. So the initiative that he started with the pogrom um, backfired. It resulted in millions of Reichsmarks of damage to the economy, severe international criticism, and a negative response from large parts of the German population. So within a couple of months, of course, the, the pogrom of uh, 9 November was followed by a further wave of anti-Semitic laws now drafted by the SS. Jews were widely excluded from economic life in Germany uh, and indeed in Austria and the Sudetenland. Their companies were forcibly Aryanized and the insurance claims for the damages they suffered in the pogroms were confiscated. In a particularly cynical move, uh, they were indeed forced to pay a redemptive fee uh, of one billion Reichsmarks, the, the Jewish community of Germany, that is, for the damages caused during the pogrom. Heydrich further, at this point, uh, proposed that in order to assist the identification of Jews in Germany and Austria, they should wear a, a distinguishing mark on their clothing, a yellow star. It's the first time that this is being proposed in Germany. And his suggestion at the time is actually turned down by Hitler in light of both public opinion and uh, because Hitler fears that further uh, pogroms will be the immediate consequence uh, of the, the marking of Jews um, in 1938. And although, of course, he, he is disappointed by his failure to secure Hitler's backing on this particular initiative, uh, Heydrich would return uh, to his proposals for the introduction of the Yellow Star uh, during the Second World War. Um, in, indeed, the introduction came in occupied Poland in 1939 and then in the Reich in 1941. So Kristallnacht and uh, the increasingly threatening uh, position towards the Jews had, of course, a profound impact on the German uh, Jewish community and the Austrian Jew Jewish community. Uh, the panic that was unleashed by the November pogrom and the loosening of immigration regulations in several countries uh, persuaded more and more Jews uh, to leave the Reich. So, as you see here, in uh, 1938 alone, some uh, 33,000 to 40,000 uh, German and Austrian Jews escaped Nazi Germany and in 1939, a further 75 to 80,000 German Jews left the country. Despite the often extraordinary uh, hardships that they expressed or experienced uh, during uh, their exodus, 
Future developments would, of course, uh, demonstrate and show that they were right to leave while they still had an opportunity to do so. Thank you.